Let's look a little bit more at the early Renaissance side sword from LK Chen, known as the Rebaldo, which I developed with them. Also, let's little, look a little bit at the history of the sword and buckler versus the sword and dagger, what happened there. And also, let's look at a little bit more cutting. Hey folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria, the fencing club. So, um, I put up a review uh, yesterday, relative to when I'm um, filming this, of the Rebaldo side sword, which is a sword that I developed with them based on an original, based on the stats of the original, which were taken by Clive Thomas. I believe the original sword is now residing in the Met Museum. Um, it was bought in auction a few years ago, probably about a decade ago now. And it is a very, very interesting sword because it's from the Alexandria Arsenal and it's an, a very early version of what some people might call a side sword, which is really a form of arming sword, one-handed medieval sword with a finger ring. But this is a very early one. This is early 15th century. See my other video for more detail on that. But I realized that there were a few things that I could add to um, the topic of this sword and similar early side swords like this, and also this specific model. Now, before I go on, there's a couple of points which have come up in regards to this specific replica. First of all, I want to clarify that I believed the uh, leather covering of this scabbard was not genuine leather. Apparently, I've been corrected by the folks at LK10, it is uh, real leather. It's just a particular type of quite shiny, softened leather. So it's not veg tanned, uh, it's some other kind of leather essentially, but it is real leather, okay, that's the first thing. Now the second thing is a question that came up a lot in the comments about the fingering here. So as I explained, uh, in the, if we just reverse that round for a second, it was very common in the 14th century, particularly in Italy, for people to start looping their lead finger over the quillon to gain more uh, point control and also to enable quicker little rotational cuts from the wrist, which is something we see a lot in Bolognese fencing as we look at 16th century treatises, for example, like Manchilino and Morozzo. Now, um, therefore, if you're putting your finger over the guard, clearly it makes sense to have a degree of protection on there uh, for the thumb, uh, for the index finger, sorry. Um, and that is a finger ring. Now, a number of people said that they wished that the ring came up to, met, to meet the blade. Now, this is an interesting point, um, and some later ones do, um, and it is shown in art sometimes that some do, but many surviving ones don't, and there is a gap there. Now, the first thing I want to mention is, first of all, it's a very small gap. Secondly, to get a blade into there, and bear in mind it's not a lot of width, to get a blade into there, you would really have to receive a blow directly down here from that 90 degree angle. Now in reality, when we're fencing, the angles that tend to happen are not 90 degrees, they're usually somewhere near 45 degrees, uh, from most um, encounters of an opponent's blade because the point's are usually somewhat towards them, which means that the chances of a blade coming down into that gap are pretty slight. Okay, that's the first part. Secondly, we have to have a degree of proportionality here and relativity. And the fact is that is a very small bar, just adding a tiny bit of protection to the index finger. The fact is, the fact there's a little gap there, well, there's a big gap there, big gap there, big gap there. Clearly the rest of the hand is not protected either. So that is clearly gonna protect the index finger a bit. You can't provide full protection to the index finger because it's completely exposed on both sides of the ring. So really fixating on that little gap, don't worry about it too much. It adds a little bit of extra protection having that ring, but at the end of the day, with these types of early period swords, the rest of your hand and your arm and the rest of your body is exposed as well. So worrying about that little gap is perhaps time not well spent. So the next very interesting point that came up was about offhand weapons. So indeed, these types of um, side sword, if we want to call them that, or um, early Renaissance arming swords with additional uh, bits on the hilt for hand protection, they are often used with offhand weapons, but they are often used by themselves as well. So if we look at Morozzo, for example, his section on using the spider solo or the sword by itself is pretty damned large, okay? So it's absolutely um, acceptable to be using, usually the hand stuck behind the back in Sony Morozzo, it's absolutely acceptable to be using this sword uh, by itself, much like we would use a military sabre, okay? 
And in fact, there's some parallels. Uh, one of the guard positions, for example, in Morozzo looks like this, which is very similar to Waite's um, high second engaging guard, which was used by a whole bunch of sabre people. So in fact, there's a lot of crossover between 19th century military sabre and side sword. Another common factor, incidentally, is the cuts are often given with a rotation from the wrist, a moulinet. Again, something we see in 19th century sabre. Not to say all cuts were, because some guards uh, cut, uh, for example, this is guarded di Dialta, and that uses a full arm motion uh, like medieval systems. So in this era, particularly the 16th century, we kind of see a cross. We can see some things that we see in later fencing systems like Sabre, and we can see some things that we see in earlier fencing systems like Langmesser, for example, and it's kind of the, the missing link between those two extremes. But it's completely correct to say that these were often used with offhand weapons. Now, the usual offhand weapon that was used with a side sword was a buckler. And this is what we, if we look at Mancellino or Morozzo, their treatises are really dominated, or Dalagocchi, um, their treatises are really uh, dominated by sword and buckler. And these were the civilian street dueling weapons, um, uh, absolute par excellence, you know, preferred of the 15th, well, 14th, 15th, and into the 16th centuries. Um, in Italy and all over the rest of Europe as well, even if we look at England or France, sword and buckler was the standard civilian armament if you were expecting trouble. Now, in reality, a lot of people would dispense with the buckler, which was usually worn hung off the belt next to the um, sword, incidentally, uh, hung off, sometimes off the sword itself, sometimes off the belt. Um, sometimes these would be seen as a nuisance and left, and so a person would just have a sword, and that's why it's also important to know how just to use the sword by itself. But lots of people, if they're expecting trouble, took a buckler. And we shouldn't, remember, or shouldn't forget, of course, that in a military context, these were the sidearms of people like archers and crossbowmen and billmen and pikemen as well. So while their primary weapons might be crossbows, longbows or halberds, their backup weapons would very often be at least a sword and very often a sword and buckler. And in fact, in England, this was the standard armament of English longbowmen. So sword and buckler use, um, it, particularly in Italian systems, they tend to keep the buckler out extended. So unlike if we look at 133 or I-33, where the buckler and the sword are kept together, often they are kept separate um, in Italian systems and the cuts and the attacks are given around the buckler, okay, with moulinets usually. Um, they do come together in certain actions, for example, if you're doing uh, like Gardi di Testa or um, forming a parry, essentially, they'll come together for an instant, but then they'll split apart again. So, sword and buckler fencing was highly, highly developed, and one of the oldest fencing systems in Europe. Uh, obviously, 133 is the earliest fencing treatise we have, it dates to about 1300, but we know that sword and buckler fencing was a thing all over Europe from the 1100s onwards. Um, so certainly the 1200s anyway. Um, so sword and buckler was very prevalent in the medieval world. But as we get into the Renaissance, we start to see something else come along. And that is the use of the left hand dagger, sometimes known in modern collecting circles as a man gauche, which just means left hand, <laughs> which doesn't really say anything. But um, this is the left hand dagger. This one has a side ring on the side there, so this is a 16th century side, um, uh, style, and the ring was put to the outside there to give a little bit of extra hand protection to the hand with blades sliding down here. So not a lot of hand protection, but a bit. And in these early systems, for example in Morozzo, um, the primary defence is still with the sword, but often you'll find that the sword might parry, the dagger will take over, and then the sword can repost. Uh, so if someone cuts on this side, for example, you parry with the sword, you could double it up with the dagger and then uh, keep the dagger there covering their sword and attack with your own sword. Sometimes it would be used um, to parry and attack with the dagger and sometimes it might be used purely to parry with the dagger and attack with the sword in the same tempo, which is known as single tempo. However, usually the two things were coupled together, at least um, against sword attacks and against particularly strong attacks. Now. Why did people go to using sword and dagger rather than sword and buckler? And when did that happen? Well, first of all, it's very evident, if we look at Morozzo, that in Morozzo's time, when he was writing in the 1530s in Italy, and obviously it's slightly different in different places, different times, in the 1530s it's evident that sword and buckler was still the predominant 
weapon set for duelists in the street and also probably the predominant sidearms for soldiers in war as well. So sword and buckler was still the most popular in the 1530s. When we get to Agrippa's time in 1550s, it seems like the dagger has started to become super popular. Now, something else important is happening in the middle of the 16th century in Italy and also places like Spain as well. And that thing is that these side swords are becoming more and more thrust centric. They're getting narrower blades, they're getting pointier blades, and they're starting to be used more of the time with the point on. That's not to say everyone did that. If we look at Dalagocchi and later 16th century sources, some people are still using choppy side swords with bucklers, but some people are using more thrusty versions with daggers. And there seems to be a correlation there, and it seems to be happening in the middle of the 16th century. Now, these thrusty versions are what most people these days would refer to as a rapier. So the arming sword, you could say, becomes the side sword, some side swords become rapiers, but some people keep using side swords that are more like arming swords. So some rapiers have more choppy blades, some rapiers and side swords have more thrusty blades. Um, now, there does seem to be a correlation between the use of the dagger with more thrust-centric styles, and this makes a degree of sense. Because if you're facing opponents who are predominantly thrusting at you, one of the problems with the buckler is it has no way of controlling the blade. You can certainly parry cuts very effectively with it, but it's not great against thrusts, and it doesn't control the blade. It doesn't capture or bind against the blade. So much so that in the 16th and 17th centuries, we actually see bucklers devised specifically to catch opponents' blades with raised rims, raised ribs, bars, hooks, all sorts of things, spikes, anything to try and gain more control of the opponent's blade when it's thrusting in a straight line at you. Now, interestingly, with a dagger, while you could say that a dagger is less good, should we say, at defending against cuts or heavy weapons like um, halberds and things like this, the dagger, what it can do is it can encounter a thrust with this long straight line and these quillons, the cross guard here, and it can control and trap. And particularly we start to get, particularly later in the 16th century, we start to get big curved quillons on some of these and devices intended to bind and trap an opponent's blade. And if you're fighting people who are now predominantly thrusting at you from different angles, this becomes very important, not only to just defend, but then to also bind against their blade while you give your own attack back. So my assertion, without going into too much detail, and obviously I could make a much, much big, vi bigger video about this with more evidence, um, but my basic assertion is that sword and dagger became more popular as fencing became more point orientated. So in other words, as rapiers came along. In the earlier style of cut and thrust, or more predominant cut and thrust fencing, uh, we find that bucklers were more popular, and there is an overlap in the 16th century. And also this, as I say, this varies by region. So in England, for example, if we look in the sources, uh, like I read on my channel sometimes, on my history story time, you will see that sword and buckler is the predominant weapon set up until about the 1580s, and then sword and dagger starts to take over. In Italy, I would say it's earlier, it's more like the 1550s, maybe 1560s, uh, when that shift happens. And both continued in use, but it was in terms of average, in terms of popularity. So most people were doing sword and buckler up until the middle of the 16th century, and then after the middle of the 16th century, most people seem to gr gradually shift to more doing sword and dagger. But even in Morozzo's time in the 1530s, he is already teaching both sword and dagger and sword and buckler. So it really, it, it does seem to have been the thing that existed earlier on, it just wasn't so popular. So to finish off, let's do a little bit more cutting. I'll try and do some different cuts that I didn't show in my previous video, because one thing I realised afterwards, in fact when I was editing it of course, was that I only cut with the front edge. One of the important things to note about medieval European swords, or at least many of them, is they are double-edged and therefore the back edge is used a lot. And this is particularly true in Italian Bolognese, that is from Bologna, um, side sword or sword fencing. Uh, and it's true of long sword as well, that the back edge is used a lot as well as the front edge. So let's look at some back edge cuts as well as front edge and combining the two. So to start, let's try a rising false edge, falso filo or back edge cut 
at the same time as holding the buckler and having to navigate around the buckler. Let's see if I can do a double cut up and down with the traverse. So up and down with the traverse. Up and down with the traverse. Up, down, thrust. Let's try a completely horizontal cut from the outside with the falso filo, with the false edge. Let's see if we can do a rapid double down down around the buckler. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> Thanks a lot for watching and I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Please click that like button and hopefully you're already subscribed. So I'll see you really soon for another video like this or other topics feel welcome to post suggestions down below. Cheers folks.